Great. Um, thank you for the very nice introduction and thanks for the invitation. I'm happy to be in Houston, but you know, unfortunately, still have to do this virtually for you know um, reasons people can guess. Uh, so I'd like to tell you today about a kind of um, bound state of axion-like particles that we've been uh, looking at the properties of for several years. So there's a like mini review of some of our work on this topic here on the right. So uh, the main results of these papers I'll go into as we go. Um, so uh, of course, feel free to stop me with questions as they come up. Um, so I won't uh, spend a lot of time motivating the general question. The general question is, we think that there's dark matter in the universe, in galaxies, in fact, in our solar system on the earth, and we'd like to detect it in a particle detector. That's kind of the holy grail of dark matter science. Uh, that's how we will really discover its particle nature and its properties. Um, and there are lots of good ideas about what dark matter might be. <clears throat> and just to distinguish what I, <clears throat> you'll have to excuse my voice a little bit today. And uh, just to distinguish what I'm talking about today from uh, what I'm not talking about, uh, I just want to classify generally um, ideas about dark matter on this simple axis of um, particle mass. Um, there are lots of really good and interesting ideas at the very heavy end, what you might call composite or macroscopic dark matter. These could be primordial black holes. Or actually I reminded him. Like, uh... Oh, is, is sorry. Sorry, that was, question, was that just... no, no, never mind. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, so there's lots of good ideas about um, very heavy dark matter at the solar mass scale or kind of macroscopic scale. Um, there's also a lot of really good work uh, being done around the TEV scale and thereabouts. So these are things like WIMPs and so on. <clears throat> uh, but I'm not talking about either of those things today. Uh, what I'm interested in is this very lightest, lowest mass range, um, which I will call just generally ultralight dark matter. Um, I will also use the word axion almost synonymously um, or ultralight scalar. Um, all of those terms, I will just mean a scalar boson um, in the mass range, you know, between 10 to the minus 22 EV and about EV. <clears throat> so why is this mass range um, especially interesting? I think there are a couple of reasons. Um, one reason is that uh, it's, a, it's a kind of simple theory in the sense that you can rule out half of your um, dark matter candidates from the start. Um, by that, I mean um, uh, particle candidates in this range must be bosons. They can't be fermions. Um, this you can derive very simply from the kinds of dark matter densities we observe. So if these particles are to be dark matter, they must have some density in galaxies. Um, this corresponds to a certain um, occupation number um, or number density, if you like. Uh, and that uh, that occupation number must be much larger than one, meaning many particles occupy a single de Broglie wavelength patch, meaning that um, it would be ruled out by the Fermi exclusion principle if they were fermions. Um, so we know such candidates must be bosons. Um, and a related fact about this ultralight dark matter is that it behaves in a wave-like manner. <clears throat> so it behaves um, as a as uh, uh, high occupancy um, waves of many particles on scales of order lambda uh, de Broglie. Um, so for different choices of particle mass, I show you here that you can have patches the size of the Earth or the size of the solar system or even the size of the whole galaxy if you really saturate this um, smallest allowed mass. <clears throat> um, these patches are sometimes called quasi particles or granules of ultralight dark matter. And I'll argue throughout this talk that these are really kind of the fundamental unit of ultralight dark matter, more so than individual ultralight bosons. You should think of halos as being composed of these um, basic, basically traveling waves um, of de Broglie wavelength scale. Um, so uh, to motivate this and things I'll talk about later, let me just show you this short clip of a simulation by the Shiva et al collaboration from 2014. This is one of the earliest ultralight dark matter simulations um, on the market. Um, and they were looking at this very uh, lightest mass range, so 10 to the minus 22 EV. And in that case, you should think of this whole thing as being a galaxy. Um, let's run it again. So what do you see um, in this simulation? <clears throat> well, you see 
Um, first of all, if, if we were living in this galaxy, you would kind of live over here on the right side about that distance from the center. Um, but more interestingly, what you see are these um, uh, density fluctuations that have a typical size. So look at the yellow and green patches. One more time. The yellow and green patches have a typical size, which is the de Broglie wavelength in this simulation. And they are just moving through the galaxy. There are these traveling waves that I've been telling you about, these quasi particles. So they interfere constructively or destructively. They pass through each other. They collide and move around. Um, and that's what the whole halo is kind of made of. And if you look at our position in the halo, you'll see that you know over some length of time, lots of these quasi particles are passing through us. So actually, the amount of dark matter around us is changing on a sort of typical time scale. This is the first evidence of uh, maybe density fluctuations. Um, a uh, second important object uh, to point out is this high density blob in the center of the galaxy. This is what's called an axion star or a boson star. Again, I'm using these terms interchangeably today. Um, but this is um, basically the ground state of the, of the ultralight dark matter field. And I'll talk about that um, a little bit more later. <clears throat> Um, so uh, uh, one motivation for this work I've already pointed out to you is the fact that, um, especially in ultralight dark matter and also in other dark matter models, there are um, density fluctuations at um, scales smaller than the galaxy. So normally what we're told is that the dark matter halo is this smooth, almost spherically symmetric um, thing, uh, which is true on large scales, which we find from simulations and also from certain kinds of observations including the one that I've highlighted here on the left. So when people ask, um, what is the density of dark matter, uh, the local density of dark matter, by which they mean, what is the density of dark matter at the position of the Earth or the sun? This is usually what they're talking about. <clears throat> so they're um, so uh, that average density at the solar position in the halo um, is constrained by observations of lots of stars um, around the galactic disk and above and below the disk. There are several observations like this, um, including the one I've highlighted here, but they, um, they are basically taking the assumption that the dark matter halo has this smooth, almost spherically symmetric shape. <clears throat> um, so I, I'm, uh, in this talk, I'm not um, denying any of these observations and I'm certainly not questioning uh, these studies. I agree that the average local density at the solar position is this usually quoted value of 0.3 GeV per centimeter cubed. And I will continue to call this the local density of dark matter. Um, but I, um, I want to raise the question in this talk whether um, this is the um, value of the density that is um, useful for experiments, uh, which is, by that I mean, um, Given that we know about small scale fluctuations in the dark matter field, for example, in ultralight dark matter, um, shouldn't we be taking this into account? And is there a way that we can um, predict um, some um, other value for the local for the local density very near us as opposed to this average local density? Um, <clears throat> so all of that is just to say, um, I would like to distinguish the local density, which is averaged over you know the solar position around the halo. Um, from the very local density, which is what is the density in our solar in our solar system specifically? Um, the answer to those two, um, the values of those two things can be very different, as I'll talk about in this talk. So, with all of that as background and motivation, um, this is basically my um, uh, outline of the talk. So, um, I will uh, in the first part, I will just review what are the kinds of density fluctuations we know exist in for ultralight dark matter. A lot of this stuff is very well known. Um, I will uh, point out what are the actual constraints on the very local density. So how do we know that the very local density in our solar system is not much, much higher than, um, than was usually quoted? <clears throat> Um, and then I will uh, try to motivate these axion solar halos um, that give me the title of this talk. So I will explain um, some plausible dynamical processes that would capture large amounts of ultralight dark matter field into the solar system, giving rise to um, uh, important differences in density at the very local scale. Um, and then I will discuss what the signals would look like in such a scenario, and especially um, tell you about this proposal of a space mission, which was recently picked up by Nature Astronomy, um, 
uh, and people are pretty excited about it, basically sending uh, atomic clocks in, out into the solar system to make a really good measurement of ultralight dark matter. Um, right, so that's gonna be the talk. Um, so uh, let's start by talking about bound states um, of, of ultralight dark matter. <clears throat> And uh, the place to begin is at the, um, the equation of motion uh, governing the field. So what do we know about ultralight dark matter? We know that it is uh, very non-relativistic, being called dark matter, and it has a very high occupation number. So it should behave as a classical field. And the classical field equation that describes um, such a field is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which I've written here at the bottom. Um, on the left side, of course, you have this um, oscillating piece, this time derivative piece, as always. But in the brackets, I've just highlighted three possible force terms um, that can that uh, can appear in the um, uh, in the balance of forces for the field. So um, in green, we have a gradient energy, basically arising just from kinetic energy or pressure of the particles. This is effectively a repulsive force. Um, there can be a, an attractive force coming from the self-gravity of the ultralight dark matter itself. So if it is self-bound, then this um, uh, self-gravity is an important term. And so in that case, you should self-consistently be solving the Poisson equation along with this nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Um, and thirdly, um, you can have a, uh, a gravitational term that is dictated by some external gravitational source. So it's basically a one over R potential dictated by some central mass. Of course, gravity in this non-relativistic limit is always attractive. Um, and to these three terms, I could also add uh, self-interaction terms, um, which are very interesting and change the picture a little bit, but I will ignore self-interactions in this talk. Um, you feel free to ask me about those later. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, let's begin by getting our feet wet a little bit with um, uh, a kind of substructure that has been known for many years. In fact, um, boson stars, as they're uh, now called, uh, these solutions have been known for 50 or 60 years, something like that. The first ones were like back in the 1960s. Um, and uh, they are essentially um, just a balance between the uh, repulsive gradient energy, um, which is this green term with a positive sign, and the attractive self-gravity of the field, which is this minus m over r term, um, and already without solving the equation, just at the level of scaling of macroscopic quantities, you can basically arrive at the correct mass radius relation for a boson star um, just by balancing these two forces. You find that the radius goes like one over the, the mass of the um, uh, one over the mass of the boson star. Um, but of course, this equation, uh, you know, coupled to the Poisson equation is not difficult to solve either. And on the left are some numerical solutions that also satisfy this mass radius relation. <clears throat> you can see in the plot on the left that the wave functions, which are like the square root of the density, basically, um, that as the central density becomes larger, the mass grows, but the radius becomes smaller and vice versa. Um, so when you throw more axions in, you um, uh, it becomes more massive, but it becomes smaller, <clears throat> so more dense. Um, these objects are sometimes called dilute boson stars to um, distinguish them from other kinds of configurations that can arise when you have self-interactions. But these are the kind of the stable solutions to the equation of motion. Um, <clears throat> uh, so it was an open question for many years whether boson stars um, actually form on astrophysically short timescales. And one of the reasons people were skeptical about this, I think, is the question of um, how do the bosons lose energy? So, you know, how do you form regular stars? Well, you know, um, you have lots of charged particles and molecular clouds and gas, and they emit photons. And by emitting photons, they can collapse, right? So they can lose enough energy to you know, hit their genes mass and collapse further. <laughs> but these bosons are at leading order, not coupled to photons or anything lighter. So how do they lose energy? Um, but these days, I think we know the answer to this. <clears throat> and there's a pretty simple picture for boson star formation that um, there's a, a clear analytical picture and it's backed up by simulations. So I think it's now pretty clear. Um, the picture is the following. So um, <clears throat> I've described to you that um, uh, in ultralight dark matter, the, the kind of uh, building blocks of an ultralight dark matter halo are these quasi particles that have de Broglie wavelength 
uh, scale. And they are, they're order one density fluctuations from the average. So some of them are a little more dense, some of them are a little less dense. So they're like traveling waves basically. And just in a kind of cartoon picture, you can imagine that these um, traveling waves are stable. So they're like fixed objects and they can scatter against each other gravitationally. So they exchange a little bit of energy and momentum each time they cross and scatter gravitationally. And so their velocities change with every crossing. And then you can ask the question, um, uh, after how many crossings will the velocity distribution of the whole you know, cluster of quasi-particles change by a significant amount by order one? Um, and this is easily calculable. So it's given in the expression on the bottom left. <laughs> um, and that uh, number of crossings corresponds to a typical, uh, what's called the relaxation time. So it's the amount of time it takes these quasi-particles given some generic initial configuration to reshuffle their velocities so that they can sample, you know, uh, they can sample different states within the halo. And so some of those quasi-particles will go to the ground state. Some of those quasi-particles will gain enough energy to be kicked out. And some of them will just sort of get heated and make the halo bigger. So they just reshuffle their energy and momentum on a typical time scale called the relaxation time. Um, it turns out that this relaxation time corresponds to the time scale for boson star formation. <clears throat> um, so this we also see in simulations like the one that I show at the top of the slide uh, by Levkov, Panin, and Ketchev, who took um, really generic, just white noise initial conditions for the momenta of the field and just evolved it with time. And they they always found somewhere in their box the formation of a boson star uh, after a time uh, roughly equal to T relax. Um, so this backs up the picture that the quasi-particles are the things that are relaxing gravitationally and that that is sufficient for both star formation. Um, and, um, and this time scale can be astrophysically fast. Um, <clears throat> um, this one simulation by Levkov, Panin, and Kachev used you know, non-physical initial conditions to kind of prove a point. But there are now um, many simulations uh, with very different kinds of initial conditions and also very different parameters for the ultralight scalar field. Um, and they seem to generically find formation of boson stars on fa astrophysically fast time scales. So in the two simulations on the left, there are um, very ultralight scalars uh, with sort of cosmological initial conditions. So you see galaxies forming, and then they form these both stars in the center of galaxies. Um, and in the, um, the fourth simulation on the bottom right, um, the um, simulators Egemeyer and Niemeyer took, um, uh, took as input the um, distribution of masses of what are called axion mini clusters, which are a, no a novel kind of substructure that appears for things like QCD axions early in the universe. And they found that within these mini clusters, there was formation of boson stars um, and, th and that it was also fast. <clears throat> Um, uh, Josh, so um, oh, uh -huh. it, it looks like Enrico has a question. Oh, yes. Okay. Joshua, yes. So uh, here you are showing us uh, like the formation based in the kinetic regime. So do you have some comment about the condensation regime, regime for formation of boson stars? Because this um, is the kinetic regime, you know, so uh, I mean. Right, uh, yes. Um, so so uh, the the terminology is not super clear, but I think I know what you mean. Um, so uh, the analytic story that I told you, so the way you can think about boson star formation is that there's kind of a fast and or a slow and quiet way, and there's a fast and violent way, right? And I think those correspond to the um, kinetic regime and the uh, condensation so, regime. So, so uh, indeed, for example, the paper that you showed me, Ejemir and uh, Ninjemir, they explicitly yeah. I say that the, most of the time of the simulation, the particles satisfy the need condition for the kinetic regime in which the particle looks like a particle. I mean, the the, the Broglie was like the particle is much smaller than the typical scale of the configuration. If you're talking about axomini cluster, for example, will be like the radius of the axomini cluster will be so much larger than the De Broglie was lambda of the particle. So uh, Ejimir showed that uh, you have this nucleation of boson stars or axon stars, and uh, the time of formation kind of uh, matches the, the predicted time for the kinetic regime. 
And, that's, and that prediction uh, matches the previous prediction of panic and lack of attackers. But also, I know that there is a condensation regime in which the, in which the particle, uh, the de Broglie wavelength is, is so much larger, you know? So this is in, in some paper of, of Alan, for example, in which particle need to talk each other and be a gravitational, a, a, a gravitational interaction that thermalize and then go to the, to the ground state. So this is that this is so you uh, uh, this is only for the kinetic regime. That's why I, I am asking you about. I know that there is no simulation for the Euler regime, but do you know something more that you can tell us? Um, I think that I don't have anything intelligent to say about the condensation regime. Yeah, I, as far as I know, all of the I think I understand your question now. I think that all of this, all of the simulations I'm talking about here and the ones that I know of are basically in the kinetic regime, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, I don't have anything additional to say about the condensation regime. Okay, very well. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, are there other questions about um, this part since we're stuck here? Um, okay. So um, so with uh, with this uh, sort of analytical picture and also uh, many simulations, by the way, there are a handful more simulations that did not make it onto the slide. So there are many more groups that are doing um, similar kinds of things. And a generic prediction of all of these simulations is the formation of boson stars. Um, so with all of this in hand, I think people are pretty convinced that boson stars are astrophysically interesting, that they seem to be semi-generic, if not fully generic. Um, and so they're good targets for um, experimental searches. Um, with all of that in mind, um, the rest of this talk will not be about boson stars, but I will draw analogies to the much more well-known system of these self-gravitating stars, um, because I want to advocate for a, um, a different kind of substructure, um, which is similar in some ways and very different in others. So, um, um, so these objects um, on the title side, I call it I called it an, an axion solar halo. More generally, you might just call it a bound bosonic halo. Uh, the meaning of this should be clear at the end of the slide. Basically, the picture is rather than a very significant contribution from the self gravity of the field, um, the this kind of bound state is dominated by the gravitational attraction of some external source. So, for example, the sun or a planet or something like this. Uh, for most of this talk, it will be the sun. Um, so rather than taking the second term, uh, the self-gravity of the field, we will take the third term, this external one over R potential. <clears throat> um, but the rest of this picture basically goes through. So you still balance a, a attractive and a repulsive force. You can easily find the mass radius relation, which looks almost identical, except it's dictated by the mass of the external source rather than the mass of the boson star. Um, so in fact, the mass of the boson star at the at this level is just a free parameter. It doesn't determine any of the macroscopic properties um, except for, you know, I mean the density, uh, but it doesn't it doesn't modify the radius at all. As long as the um, the mass of the bound state is much smaller than the mass of the external um, binding source, um, which is always the limit you want to be in, by the way. Um, if you solve these, the equation of motion for this, I think everyone, if they thought about it for five seconds, would get the answer to this. These are just hydrogen wave functions, right? It's a Schrodinger equation with a one over our potential. The ground state is just an exponential function, just like the ground state of hydrogen. And so you can see this also in the solutions on the left. Um, and, and in fact, this uh, radius R star is just the gravitational Bohr radius of, um, uh, of this system. So the picture in this talk um, is that um, uh, you, um, you can have uh, bound states of ultralight dark matter around uh, astrophysical bodies. And furthermore, that their um, radius is a direct function of the particle mass. So actually just positing the idea of these bound states, you already know what is the target mass range that is interesting. For example, if we wanted one of these things to be supported by our sun in our solar system, and we wanted to search for it in experiments on Earth, then we need its radius to be at least an AU. Um, in order for its radius to be at least an AU, you need the particle mass to be smaller than about 10 to the minus 14 EV, which you can see in the expression on the bottom. Um, then the Earth will be inside of this bound halo, 
And so the experimental searches will be sensitive to you know, the properties of this bound halo. <clears throat> um, if on the other hand, uh, in our original paper, we also considered the case of a bound state around the earth, in which case the parametrics are very different, then you only need it to be as big as the radius of the earth to see it in experiments on Earth's surface. And then you want masses smaller than about nano EV. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, most of this talk will be about the first case, about a solar halo where more work has been done. But if there's some time at the end, I'll mention the Earth halo and what the challenges are there. Um, challenges and promises, yep. So um, the first question that should come to mind, and I'm sure it already has, um, is the same one for boson stars. You know, Sure, there's a um, solution to the um, equations of motion that have a ground state and so on, but do they really form? Um, and I can't fully answer that question for you today. Um, actually, it's a um, it's a work we've had in progress for more than two years, and it's finally coming to fruition. Uh, and it's based on the um, the kinds of things that I'm going to motivate for you in the next few slides. But I don't have results to show you yet. Um, so um, please be on the lookout for our paper in a few weeks. But anyway, <clears throat> for now, I just want to convince you that at least this is plausible enough to be interested in the second half of my talk. Um, so, uh, what's the first, what's the first, um, um, physical argument for why something like this bound, um, bosonic halo should form, uh, this solar halo? Well, um, just imagine that, um, the exact same physical processes that were forming boson stars in the previous slide, imagine those same physical processes, um, uh, taking place in the presence of a very deep gravitational well. So for example, the sun. <clears throat> so you have these quasi particles, they're bouncing around, they're exchanging energy. And after some typical time scale, which we don't, I'm not calculating at this moment, but after some amount of, some number of scatters, these quasi particles will sample uh, state space. Some of them will find their way into the ground state and some of them will be kicked out of this little mini halo. Um, and uh, then the question is, um, what is the ground state that is being sampled in this process? Um, the ground state of this system, this picture, is clearly you know, deep inside this gravitational well of the sun. The, the very obvious ground state in this picture is a bound state around the sun. Um, so if these quasi-particles um, have sufficient time to sample, uh, you know, um, the states available to them, some of them will find their way into this ground state, which is a bound state. Um, that's all you need to believe in order to believe at least there'll be some amount of bound mass around the sun. Um, this does not prove that the time scale is fast. It doesn't prove that it's faster or slower than, uh, than it would be for the self-gravitating case, but the same dynamical processes should still um, be um, present. <clears throat> Secondly, um, so unfortunately, there are not um, uh, full-scale simulations of this. Actually, we are doing simulations uh, in our paper that's coming in a few weeks. Um, but there's only one paper in the literature that I know of that uh, does anything like evolving ultralight dark matter in the presence of uh, external gravitational source. And, that's where, and it's this work by Veltma, Schwabe, and Niemeyer. Um, there, they were interested in something like a baryonic um, bulge in galaxies. So they just wanted to evolve one of these ultralight dark matter galaxies, um, just like the simulations I was showing you earlier, <clears throat> but they evolved them in the presence of a fixed central core, basically just a lump of gravity um, that was unchanging. And they just asked the question, you know, how does ultralight dark matter organize itself in the presence of that central potential? Um, and they compared it to the just ultralight dark matter only case. So in the two um, in the two panels on the left, FDM just means ultralight dark matter. They called it fuzzy dark matter. This is just another name. Um, so you should try to compare uh, in your head the blue line and the green line in the panels on the left. <clears throat> and the upper panel is at early times, redshift almost six, and the um, lower one is at some later time. So you see that. Um, uh, at early times, the um, this central core region in the green uh, on the green line for fuzzy dark matter only um, forms somewhat fast. <clears throat> it appears that you're forming this central core that is the central boson star. However, after you know a few redshift of order few, 
um, the case with baryons actually um, overtakes the case with um, no baryons. So what does this mean? A, I'm sorry. Oh, I thought I heard a question. Anyway, um, so um, a, a couple of things we take away from this. Um, one is that the um, the formation of this central uh, core was still fast, even in the presence of a central potential. Two, um, the central density actually ended up higher when there was a central potential rather than just ultralight dark matter. Um, and third, when they um, uh, mapped the um, density function of this blue curve in the lower left panel, they actually found that it had a it matched very well to an exponential profile, um, just like the kind of hydrogen atom ground state that I was describing um, at the level of the equation of motion. Um, so um, again, this is not a proof because this is also a very different physical system. This is like a whole galaxy with a big baryonic bulge. It's not a solar system with a sun. Um, but again, the same dynamical processes should be present at this different scale. So it's just a question of whether the time scales are fast enough um, for this to work. <clears throat> um, there is Judge, a. It, it uh, does look like there's a question. But it has oh, okay. A question. I'm I'm sorry. I can't I can't see the hands on my screen. So. Uh, yeah. So sorry. Um, so I had a question before you go forward with this. Um, so when you mm -hmm. when you talk about. When, when you think of the central potentials, like you know the over densities surrounding the sun or the earth, um, what mass ranges are you thinking about? Are you thinking of masses so small such that the typical de Broglie wavelength is much bigger than the size of the sun even? Uh, yes, that's right. Um, so in this slide, you kind of get the parametrics of what we're um, what we're looking at. So um, for a bounce state around the sun, we um, generically want its size to be at least AU because that's where we could easily detect it on Earth. And in that case, you just need to calculate this gravitational Bohr radius and you get a simple relationship given in the bottom left um, of, the, um, of the slide. The radius is at least AU whenever the mass of the particle is smaller than 10 to the minus 14 EV. Um, so that's the kind of mass range we're interested in. Few orders of magnitude, um, below 10 to the minus 14 EV um, and somewhat higher for the Earth halo. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, we can talk later about this. I have a little, uh, sure. I have some more questions, but I don't want to uh, dwell into them. Um, okay, yeah. It, if at the end I haven't answered the questions, I'm happy to, happy to chat at the end or also offline or, you know, online, but some other time. <laughs> Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, good. Uh, so this this I think of as a second hint that the kinds of uh, ordinary dynamical ultralight dark matter processes can give rise to these bound states. Um, but there is a third line of evidence um, that we're, we've been pursuing, um, and it's based on a very different picture. So here the picture is more um, historical. So um, you just ask the question. Um, uh, how was the sun formed? So what do we know about star formation in the late universe, so somewhat recently? Um, well, they form from these um, large uh, molecular clouds um, that are kind of diagrammatically pictured on the top right here. Um, these large molecular clouds um, fragment into these smaller star forming cores that have typical size of like 0.1 parsec. Um, and these, uh, protostellar cores basically just collapse gravitationally. And at the end of the day, there's you know a whole bunch of mess. But at the end of the day, there's a sun in the center and there's a rotating disk of stuff. That rotating disk becomes planets and so on. And that's how the sun uh, comes to be. Um, uh, in the typical picture, you know these clouds are just moving through the halo just like everything else. So they have typical velocity, you know, 200 kilometers a second. And the dark matter also has typical velocity 200 kilometers a second, and everything's just moving through each other and they don't interact. Um, but if you imagine that somehow a very, very tiny fraction of the dark matter that's passing through becomes gravitationally bound to these collapsing protostellar cores. And when I say very, very small, I mean actually small. I'll give you numbers in a second. Um, if there was a little bit of dark matter bound to these collapsing protostellar cores, then it will drag 
gravitationally dark matter down into a denser configuration around the sun. Um, this process is um, known by astronomers uh, by the name adiabatic contraction. It's very well understood in like baryonic physics, but it's really purely gravitational. There's no reason dark matter can't um, be adiabatically contracted. Um, and so, um, yeah, if you have a little bit of dark matter bound to these collapsing cores, it will end up in a dense configuration around the sun. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, in a study by Anderson, Partenheimer, and Weiser, they pointed this out. Um, they weren't interested in ultralight dark matter. They just said this is a fairly generic process. And in fact, they said in this highlighted passage, um, even a very small initial abundance, a one in 10 to the 10 fraction of the local density gets bound in the initial collapse. It will give rise to a, a density, a bound density that is the same order as the uh, background density. Um, so you really need a very, very small seed to give rise to a very, very dense bound state. Um, so um, this is another, um, uh, uh, you know, more historical, more astrophysical picture of how um, scalar fields might get bound around the sun. <coughs> um, all of these things are uh, on the table for us, and they're being uh, worked out in a final version of things that I would have loved to show you today, but it just is, not, you know, epsilon away from being ready. Um, so please talk to me sometime soon or be on the lookout for our paper uh, coming out, which I think is going to be very cool. Um, but with all of that as motivation for these bound states, I would like to tell you, um, uh, given that such bound states could form, what, would the, what are the constraints on those things look like and what will the signals look like in experiments um, and why are these interesting targets? Um, so we can proceed. So the first question you should ask, um, if you grant that such bound states could form, you should ask, well, how dense can they be? How much extra dark matter could I put in the solar system before I begin to violate some direct experimental bound? You know, what are the actual limits on dark matter in our solar system? And um, uh, the strongest limits basically come from um, comparing the orbits of different satellites around the sun. Satellites meaning planets and in fact, asteroids. Um, the picture is basically the following. So suppose in this picture on the left, the central mass is the sun and the green mass is something like Mercury. It's the innermost planet to the sun. So you might think, um, you know, if there's dark matter inside the orbit of Mercury, um, that additional mass will uh, modify the orbit of Mercury. It will cause perihelion to process and so on. Um, so if we measure Mercury's orbit very well, we might be able to derive a good limit on dark matter you know, in uh, the orbit of Mercury. But actually that's not quite true because um, if uh, there, you're actually limited by uh, how well we know the mass of the sun. Um, and by the mass of the sun, in this case, I mean the baryonic mass of the sun. So in fact, it turns out you could have uh, a sun that was only 99% baryons and 1% dark matter, and Mercury wouldn't know the difference because it just sees the total mass, um, and it wouldn't disrupt any um, solar processes. You know, you can fit all the solar models and all this kind of stuff. So you know, at at the level of you know what are the real constraints on gravity in our solar system, uh, one orbit doesn't do it. It actually is better to compare multiple orbits. For example, in the picture, you can think this is Mercury and Venus or Venus and Earth and so on. Um, and in the paper uh, here by Pijev and Pijeva, um, that is uh, in some simplified sense what they do. <clears throat> um, what they end up with is a set of constraints um, corresponding to different approximate differences, distances in the solar system, um, uh, roughly at the position of these planets. Um, so in this figure, I'm showing the maximum density uh, normalized to the usual 0.3 GeV per centimeter cubed. So this is like the overdensity as a function of radius in the solar system. <clears throat> and you see that the constraints from uh, planetary observations correspond to um, roughly 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6 or 7 uh, times the local, the usual local dark matter density. Um, the other thing I'm showing in this figure is um, what would be the shape of these bound um, axion halos, axion solar halos, um, if they saturated these uh, maximum densities at different choices of particle mass. So for example, if you look at the red dashed curve, the red dashed curve corresponds to a radius of roughly one AU. 
um, there the, um, the density of this uh, solar halo is limited by the strongest constraint, which is Mars. So it can't be uh, more dense than you know, a few times 10 to the four. Um, however, if the particle mass becomes larger, then the solar halo becomes smaller. And so it, doesn't, it isn't constrained by these um, planets at higher radii. So in fact, if you, if you went down to 10 to the minus 13 EV, um, the solar halo would be fully within the orbit of Mercury. And then none of these observations really set a direct constraint. On the other hand, at such large masses, the solar halo doesn't reach the Earth. So you can't find it on Earth. Um, we'll come back to that later. Um, um, so these are the existing constraints from planets. Um, and this has been the case since basically 2013. There's basically been no update. Um, I want to point out briefly a preliminary work, but should be out basically any time, um, where we point out that um, actually um, very well-tracked asteroids can be basically a competitive um, constraint on dark matter in our solar system. So along with um, uh, several different collaborators, including one at uh, JPL, um, we used um, uh, uh, data from the Bennu asteroid, which is exceptionally well-tracked, uh, in order to constrain the dark matter in the vicinity of Bennu's orbit. And you see in the figure on the left that it's you know, an order of magnitude or a few times an order of magnitude weaker than it, the nearby Earth constraint, um, but it's fairly competitive. Um, and this is really just a proof of concept. So we're hoping that there will be many more well-tracked asteroids, um, maybe even better than Bennu. Um, and they can be at different distances where we don't really have constraints. And so these could, this could be a new way to kind of map the dark matter density in the solar system. Um, so uh, be on the lookout for that paper as well. Um, there's a lot I could say about the Bennu asteroid and this OSIRIS-REx mission from NASA, which is just super cool. But um, I encourage you to Google it because it is just a fantastic example of what humanity can do, you know, um, taking dust from an asteroid and um, depositing it in a capsule in the ocean and then flying by another asteroid and so on. Super cool stuff. Um, and it can constrain dark matter in our solar system. Um, so uh, given those constraints and given uh, what I've already told you about the structure of these um, solar halos, um, and in fact, Earth halos, I can map the density constraints, uh, the density of dark matter, for example, at 1 AU, I can map them to a constraint on the solar halo density as a function of mass, because the mass determines the radius, and I fix the radius to be 1 AU, and I determine rho at 1 AU, so I get, um, I get a constraint on what the very local density would be at the Earth's surface. So if you have a solar halo, you would look on the um, the line on the left side, um, the solar halo can be as dense as 10 to the four or maybe 10 to the five times the local, but it's a strong function of the particle mass, as I pointed out before. Um, I'll just say in passing that the constraints on Earth halos are much, much weaker. This is because um, uh, you, again, you need basically two satellites orbiting the thing, and we have measured the moon very well, but the next best measured thing is something like the Lageo satellite, which is in low Earth orbit. Um, and you can basically, um, you know, the best you can do comparing these two, um, these two orbits is um, given on the right side here. So uh, for some choices of particle mass, you could have an Earth halo with 10 to the 18 times the local density without violating any constraint, um, which is a cool little tidbit, um, but we'll leave it for now. Josh, you think the production mechanisms you alluded to could lead to such large hal Earth scale halos? Um, so yeah, so th this part of the analysis is totally independent of the formation story. So I'm just saying, yeah. what are the constraints? Yeah. I know, um, but I'm so, asking what's my prior supposed to be on crazy overdense halos centered at the Earth? Um, based, based on you, the fact that you've been thinking about production mechanisms for these types of halos. Um, yeah, the short answer I can give, you know, it'll it'll all be answered in our paper. Um, the short answer I can give is that um, the solar halos are much more plausible, not merely because you know you only need to saturate the density, you only need ten to the four or ten to the five, but also just parametrically, it ends up more in your favor. Um, the Earth is moving around much more; it's much less likely to capture. Um, I think. Um, yeah. So we. Uh, uh, yeah. 
I should say also so, as a caveat, we've thought much less about the Earth halo. Okay, yeah. But I guess I was also thinking about tidal effects where could you actually strip the Earth scale halo from, I don't know, the motion of the other planets or something. But anyway, let me not derail too much of these questions. Yeah, these are, these are good questions. And I definitely want to think more about the Earth halo. Like once we have the dynamical processes and the solar halo kind of worked out, it would be interesting to think about how different uh, the case yeah. is for Earth. But yeah, I haven't thought that much about it. Uh, yep. Yeah, good question. Um, um, by the way, I can also translate this um, this maximum density into a maximum bound fraction to give you a little more of a sense of like how much additional mass are we actually talking about adding. So for example, at 10 to the minus 14 EV, um, in order to saturate this um, you know, maximum bound density, you only need to add a 10 to the minus 12 solar mass amount of ma dark matter bound to the sun in order to maximize that uh, limit. Um, so we're not talking about like huge amounts of matter. Um, in fact, I like to show this slide just to really drive that point home. Um, uh, you could, you know, you could reasonably thinking about one small asteroid of dark matter spread out over a distance of 10 or 100 AU. And this would be enough to give you a 10 to the 4 over density in dark matter um, at a distance of 1 AU. Um, that is an extraordinarily small amount of additional mass. And it, a question just to ponder later is, like, do we really know at that level of precision how much dark matter kind of could get bound during solar formation or um, through some dynamical process? You know, how confident are we there isn't one extra asteroid of dark matter floating around? Um, we will be answering that question in our paper, but it's you know food for thought in the meantime. Um, so um, uh, speaking of signals, so one thing you might think is, okay, very cool, the density can be larger, but can't I just rescale all my limits by square root of rho? So uh, most experiments are sensitive to linear couplings. So phi goes like square root of rho. So if the density grows by 10 to the four, my signal, is stronger by 10 to the two. So we just draw another line and we're done. Um, it turns out it's more interesting than that, um, which is fun and cool. Um, and one of the ways that this uh, is true is that the, um, the coherence properties of the bound state will be very different than the coherence properties of the general dark matter halo. Um, this is easy way to think about this is just that for the axions to be bound, they must be colder so their velocity is lower. So they oscillate for more um, cycles before they decohere. Um, so ordinary virial dark matter oscillates for 10 to the six cycles of one over M, whereas the solar halos would oscillate for, you know, maybe 10 to the seven or 10 to the eight cycles because they're much colder. So this means that the coherence time of the field is much longer. And this has implications for experimental searches because generally, and dark matter searches are optimizing their scanning times based on the assumption of, you know, virial dark matter. But it could be the fact that where they thought they could they could only gain signal coherently on a time scale of a day, um, for example, at this 10 to the minus 14 EV benchmark, the dashed line coincides with roughly one day coherence time. So maybe the experiment was only going to run for a day. Um, but actually, the coherence time, if it was a solar halo, would be a year. So that experiment could integrate much, much more signal, um, you know, at those points and actually become much more sensitive just by choosing their shot times um, effectively in a, in a direct search for a solar halo. Um, in the figure on the right, I'm basically showing what is the possible gain if you really optimized your experiment for these long coherence times, um, you know, because basically you're, you're roughly going to gain is the square root of t. Um, and so you can gain, you know, one or several orders of magnitude, depending on the experiment. Um, so that's that's a um, practical um, thing that an experiment would want to take into account in a in a um, focused search for a bound state. Um, <clears throat> um, I'm sort of running out of time, so I want to get to the results here. So um, I'm going to skip over this slide fairly quickly. Basically, um, um, atomic physics, atomic clock systems are very good um, test beds for ultralight dark matter because 
Um, the oscillations of the ultralight scalar field induce oscillations of fundamental constants, like the fine structure constant or the electron mass. And those things will modify the frequencies of photon emissions in atomic systems. And so they can measure those frequencies very well. Um, so modern optical clocks are basically sensitive to variations in the fundamental constant at the level of 10 to the minus 18, um, which is very incredible. And there are proposals for future nuclear clocks. They don't exist yet, but the proposals are, I'm told they're realistic, um, that could be uh, sensitive at the level of 10 to the minus 23, uh, which would be, I think, the most sensitive uh, systems uh, ever built, uh, more sensitive even than LIGO by some standard. <clears throat> um, so, um, uh, what do those um, atomic clock searches look like? Um, in the usual case where you build an atomic clock on Earth, this is sort of the normal thing to do. So the D alpha is this coupling basically to uh, F mu nu, F mu nu, uh, which uh, couples the, the phi field. The uh, gray region is the region ruled out by equivalence principle tests, um, basically looking for long range forces from ultralight scalars phi. So those don't depend on the dark matter density. Um, and then the brown region and the purple region on the top right um, are existing direct searches. Um, and we see that uh, clocks at the level of 10 to the minus 18 um, would be sensitive to new parameter space in the presence of a solar halo. And of course, a nuclear clock would be would really carve up this parameter space a lot. Um, however, there are these kind of natural benchmarks, uh, pun intended, I guess. Um, one benchmark you might want to reach for um, these ultralight scalars is you know, just a natural scalar, a scalar where these couplings don't induce large corrections to the mass. Um, and even for a very low cutoff scale, you know, this red line corresponds to, I think, 3 TeV, um, even a future nuclear clock will not reach below this, you know, natural line. So if you really care a lot about naturalness, this is a good target. Um, so uh, what do we do? Um, one thing we can do is, um, uh, broaden our search a bit. Um, so I told you that when the particle mass becomes somewhat larger, larger than you know, a few times 10 to the minus 14, um, the size of the solar halos becomes very small. And when the solar halo is totally confined, for example, within the orbit of Mercury, um, there are almost no constraints on its density. Um, the strongest constraint on dark matter in the very inner reaches of the solar system essentially come from uncertainties on the baryonic mass of the sun, which are very weak. Um, so this, uh, uh, if such solar halos formed at these masses, um, which again, we'll answer in our paper. Um, I think the answer is yes, by the way, just to give you a preview. Um, the, um, these, these inner parts of the solar system might be really ideal places to, um, to search because the densities uh, uh, that um, respect all existing experimental limits can still be very large. Mm. So we just asked the question, what if we could probe R much less than AU? Um, there's a problem and we don't want to be too full of hubris because we know the famous myth of Icarus who had his waxen wings melted because he tried to fly and do things near the sun. Um, but uh, I think in the modern day, we are much smarter than Icarus because we have heat shields, which he did not bring, which is unfortunate for him. Um, so uh, uh, this image on the bottom right is actually an image of a currently, it's a cartoon obviously, but it's a uh, cartoon of a currently operating space probe known as the Parker Space Probe. Parker Solar Probe, sorry. Um, and this probe has been operating since 2018. And it is it has been for several years far within the orbit of Mercury, you know, has been probing inside. Um, um, they have this very impressive heat shield and a lot of complicated electronics on board. So they, they already have the capacity to manage temperature fluctuations and manage magnetic field fluctuations. Of course, their goal is to measure solar properties and so on. Um, but uh, given that this is possible, couldn't we put other kinds of experiments on such probes in the future? Um, <clears throat> uh, the other side of this is that uh, atomic clocks in space are already well motivated for lots of other reasons. And um, federal governments around the world are super excited and they're basically racing to put the best atomic clock in space right now. 
So um, NASA currently has a, uh, their deep space atomic clock has demonstrated a 10 to the minus 14 stability in space. This corresponds roughly to um, the ability to measure like delta alpha over alpha at this level, not exactly, but roughly. Um, uh, Chinese mission has roughly the same uh, level of stability demonstrated in space. And there's a new mission supposed to launch this year. I haven't checked in on it in a few months. Maybe it's delayed. Um, but they have a target sensitivity of 10 to the minus 16. And I'm expecting this to rapidly improve. Um, it's expected to rapidly improve because they are interested for reasons other than fundamental physics. Um, governments like to pour money into things like um, improving GPS systems or uh, better timekeeping on board the International Space Station or whatever comes next. Or um, in the event that we actually want to have colonies on the moon or on Mars, we will need to have really high fidelity clocks in space for um, long distance communication. Um, um, it, it would be very difficult to do that from ground to ground. Um, and we are just throwing into the mix. Um, maybe they could also with minor modifications do ultralight dark matter detection. Um, so at the end of the day, this is what the um, potential sensitivity looks like for, um, again, maximizing this um, solar halo density, um, but at, a, at different positions in the solar system. So the black lines correspond to the terrestrial searches that I've already told you about. The red line corresponds to um, probes at the uh, position of Mercury, and uh, the blue lines correspond to 0.1 AU, which, by the way, is still a factor of two um, farther from the sun than Parker, so Parker Solar Probe is right now. Um, so this is, you know, of course, this is optimistic, but it's conservative in that specific sense. Um, and uh, if you were to optimize an atomic clock search for this high frequency run where you could um, integrate for long periods of time and get to this really target sensitivity, this would give you the first, I think this is the first proposal that can possibly get below these model benchmarks um, at very, very small couplings, um, you know, especially in this range of like 10 to the minus 13 EV. Um, there's of course lots of work that would need to be done to make this possible. Um, so we did discuss with um, Parker Solar Probe scientists to understand a bit more what they have done and what is possible. Um, and I, I was actually surprised at how um, uh, not just helpful, but excited they were. They thought it was a cool idea. Um, they, um, they pointed out that actually the heat shield is amazing. Um, the temperature variation is only maybe minus 40 to 40 degrees Celsius. So uh, an atomic clock can totally operate at 40 degrees Celsius, my clock friends tell me. Um, so actually the cold temperatures might be more um, dangerous than the hot temperatures. Um, and similarly, the magnetic field variations are um, pretty well under control. And of course you could put um, special shielding, you know, if there are certain frequency ranges that are especially um, dangerous. Um, and on the clock side, we would need um, portable and automated clocks because you can't always communicate um, with the clock when it's on the other side of the sun, for example needs to be lightweight to be on a probe. Um, and it would have to be optimized for this high frequency run. Um, and you know, in our dreams, we would love to send multiple clocks to measure different couplings um, because um, different clock technologies are sensitive to different kinds of couplings. Um, I've been talking about couplings to um, alpha, the fine structure constant, but if you have, uh, which are sensitive um, micro, or I'm sorry, optical clocks are sensitive to um, alpha. Um, if you have microwave clocks, which is just a different um, physical system, a di physical atomic system, um, I have a backup slide if you want to hear more, um, you could be sensitive to variations in the electron mass. Uh, and if you were to uh, realize that a nuclear clock, it would be not only sensitive to alpha, but also to QCD couplings, you know, fluctuations of the quark masses uh, divided by length of QCD. Um, I think that's all I have time to tell you. Um, there is some interesting work to do with Earth halos. Um, actually, lots of experiments have gotten excited about probing Earth halos because there's tons of clocks in the nano EV range. Um, and so they're looking for targets and we've given them one. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, but anyway, um, uh, my quick conclusion is just that I hope I've convinced you that there are um, really interesting potential um, solar system scale fluctuations in the ultralight dark matter field, including these bound states. Um, I have hopefully advertised my paper enough that you'll go and read it when it comes out. Um, I think it's going to be really cool. 
Um, and the other takeaway message is that the um, gravity only constraints on the very local dark matter density are actually not that strong. And so it would be cool to have new ideas or even probes to send out into the solar system that could just tell us how much dark matter we have. Um, I think that's a really important and under investigated question. Um, so uh, with that, I'll thank you for your attention. That's a lot for everybody. Thanks a lot, Josh. <laughs> sure. Um, so I guess we can also click this clap button. Oops, oh. button. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Other questions for Josh? Luis has a question. Uh, yeah. So it was um, we were talking about the uh, the both solar and um, the Earth halo. Uh, there is a bit mm -hmm. of a spot in the middle where things kind of dip. So is it possible to produce things like Jupiter, which has like many moons, and it's also in at least in terms of order of magnitude, a bit of an in between mass to kind of like fill out, fill out those spaces? Um, yes, um, that's a very good point. So in this kind of inner region here, maybe you're talking about like yeah. around 10 to the minus 13 EV. Um, yeah, I think Jupiter would probably be a good probe for that. Um, so the main the main thing dictating this, as I pointed out, is just the mass of the central body. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jupiter in, in log scale, Jupiter is right in between the Earth and the Sun, right? Yeah. Um, so we didn't look at it in our paper, but I think that would be a good um, a good target for that. Like, give you know, if these things form around the Earth, then they would form around Jupiter. I don't see any reason they wouldn't. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. So Chris, Chris has a question. Yeah, it was it was more about the um, on the experimental side when you were pointing out how well it wasn't just a naive scaling of these limits, um, but there mm -hmm. were some other effects. I had a slightly different question, which is, so as an experimentalist, it'd be great if you could somehow boost the density of, of um, the, if the, the local density was a factor of 10 to the five higher, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, that yeah. makes our, our jobs a lot easier. What I don't know, and I, I don't know if it's for you or someone else here, is are there, does that mean there are certain um, models of ultralight dark matter that then we are suddenly sensitive to that we didn't think we were? Is there any, is there, um, I guess for the, in the ultralight cases, um, are there any reasons to favor certain masses or, or coupling to something else that isn't just purely gravity? Um, are there any sort of, well, Where's all the model building happening? I'm just trying to think. The, the, the sudden boosts in, in in local density somehow mean that we're that we can potentially be sensitive to something that that we didn't necessarily think we were. You see what I mean? Uh, I think so. So tell me if this is in the direction of what you were thinking about. So um, one of the things we did in 2019, so we were looking at um, just existing and proposed searches for axions. Um, and one, one uh, important one is Casper Electric, which searches for um, uh, cup, nuclear couplings of this form. Um, and uh, what we pointed out in that paper is actually even in phase one, so this is their sensitivity to the coupling as a function of M. We pointed out that even in phase one, when their sensitivity is ostensibly much uh, far too weak to reach the QCD line, um, they, in fact, in the presence of a solar or Earth halo, they would be reaching the QCD line, right? And so um, in this sense, the, the experiment you already wanted to build um, would be sensitive to these models you didn't think it was sensitive to. Um, uh, yeah, and of course, there are, there are models, which I can point you to papers, that extend, extend or modify the story of um, vanilla QCD axions to push the line a little bit up or down and so on. Um, so, you know, those things would be targets as well. Okay. Is there anything equivalent for dark photons? Just or more vector particles or do you know? Um, Maybe that's for someone so, else. It, yeah, I know that um, uh, Mustafa has worked a lot on vector, vector boson stars and other people in this room for sure. Um, uh, in principle, uh, I don't see any reason why these kinds of bound states couldn't be formed from spin one particles, um, but it's still early days. We have, we've basically never thought about it. So that's a good question. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Dorian? Hi, Josh. Um, well, have you looked at um, 
self interactions of this new um, biofield? Um, yes, in a sense. So um, there are two ways that I know of that self interactions can modify this picture. Um, so one of them, I don't know the right slide to show, maybe this one. Um, so there's an old story for um, self gravitating boson stars that, you know, um, generically, the leading self interaction is like a minus lambda phi to the four. This mm -hmm. is what usually shows up in axion theories. Um, so that's an attractive force, and it, it becomes relevant at high densities. So when we're looking at this equation of motion, that would appear up here as some higher power of psi. Mm -hmm. um, but at, at high enough densities, that attractive force turns on, and that actually destabilizes the star and causes it to collapse. So this is well known for self-gravitating boson stars. And something similar would be true for these halos. So if you have strong enough self-interactions, they will be destabilized by the attractive self-interaction and so they'll collapse. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's one way self-interactions would show up. Um, so here I basically just assumed that they're weak enough that they don't collapse this, this bound states. Um, the second way I can think of that they would show up is in some of these dynamical processes. Um, so. Um, the hints that I was telling you about were basically gravity only in terms of formation of these bound halos. Um, but in principle, um, point like self interactions like lambda phi to the four can lead to relaxation of axion field onto bound states. Um, and just it's just that the time scales are different and it depends on the coupling. Um, mm -hmm. So there's been some work by um, Chanda Preska Weinstein, and then more recently by David Marsh and collaborators looking at the time scale for self interactions and relaxation. Mm -hmm. um, and the usual case for typical parameters is that it's much slower than gravity. That, you know, if the decay, if the coupling is very large, then it can be faster than gravity. Um, so. All right. Okay. I mean, I, I ask because whenever I think of um, the sun capturing dark matter, I go to um, potential boosted dark matter models and having sensitivity mm -hmm. to dark matter that's boosted from the solar core. So I was wondering if you could have a degree of self interactions in which you could have these, you know, fields um, generating so ge generating some kind of boosted version of itself, um, or you know, having I guess a two component field or something if you'd then be able to get sensitivity to some boosted dark matter models, especially if you can, um, you know, increase the, look, the, the dark matter density so much. Um, um, so, do you, so do you mean that um, uh, with, within this halo, once it has formed, there could be mm -hmm. self interactions that kick out high energy axions, and then those can be a target, sort of yes. like a boost, you know, exactly. relativistic axion. Yeah, um, or just some boost factor. Or I think maybe um, in boosted dark matter models, it's a two component model where a heavy cold guy decays to a relativistic guy that then gets detected at Earth. But yeah, you I can know. have, I think, um, I think there's Z3 symmetries that you can have with dark matter as well. If you can, if it's self interacting, you can have like a, you have to introduce a, I need to have a think about it again, but you can have two dark matter particles going into a boosted version and um, of itself, and then some other particle that's not necessarily dark matter. Um, so I, I haven't thought about like extended sectors that include, you know, uh, mass mass hierarchies and stuff. So maybe that would be um, some a target. Um, I have done a lot of work on um, decay of bound states by self interactions. So for example, mm -hmm. you can have within self gravitating boson stars, for example, you can have annihilation of cold bosons going to relativistic bosons. And so those get emitted mm -hmm. from the star um, because there's no, you know, there's no U1 symmetry protecting a real scalar. So they can have number changing transitions. Um, and those emitted guys would be relativistic. Um, however, for um, stable bound states, dilute boson stars are also these bound halos. The decay rate is exponentially small. It's tiny, tiny. All oh, right. Um, so, you, um, so you do see those relativistic particles in collapse though. When they collapse, when these things collapse, you actually excite those number changing processes 
And so you can convert a lot of the energy into relativistic particles. Um, so uh, at least that's true for boson stars. And we guess it's probably true for these bound halos. Um, mm. Cool. Thanks, Josh. Okay. okay, we're running a bit over. I have another question, but maybe, and maybe others do as well, but we should excuse the rest of the audience um, <laughs> and also have an opportunity for everybody to thank Josh one more time for the very nice talk. So thanks, Josh, a lot. Thank you. Um, thank you.